What does it really mean to be born again? I am sure many of you that are listening to my voice this morning will believe that you truly have been born again. And I'm sure that after I finish this video, many of you will wonder if that's really true. The video is not designed to create doubt, but I want to see you really ready to meet our King, our Savior, the Lord Jesus Christ, Yeshua HaMashiach, for those that prefer the Hebrew version of that. I really got deeply into the study of this because of some verbiage that I saw written in the Bible. And the deeper I looked at this, the deeper I realized many profess Christianity. It's as if they borrowed the name of Christian. But at the end, you're going to have to make the decision or the decision will be made whether or not you have his name on loan or if you truly have it because you were born again, filled with the Holy Spirit. I want you to really take the time to listen to every word. I feel like <clears throat> it's that important. So let's get started. Regardless of where you may hear this video, you may be listening to it on our Patreon channel where it will air first. You may listen to it on Israeli News Live or iConnect FX, Fact News Network, the Noon Institute of Biblical Research. It will be posted in many forums because I want everyone to be able to hear what I'm going to say. And I'm really trusting our Heavenly Father that if there's something missing, we're going to work on this together so that we truly can say <clears throat> we are Christians and we will meet again. I want to start here in the book of Romans. Oddly enough, we're going to be looking at Romans. We're going to be looking at Matthew chapter 3. We'll be looking at John chapter 8, Psalm 23, Psalm uh, 103. Believe it or not, Psalm 23 is a new birth message. <laughs> it's amazing. A lot of us, we don't even think of it, right? Matthew chapter 13. I'll be also looking at the Hebrew version of that one there. John chapter 6. Isaiah chapter 2. Because oddly enough, Jesus shows you that Isaiah chapter 2 is fulfilled in John chapter 6. We'll be looking at Hosea chapter 6, kind of goes together with those three there. Uh, getting in conclusion in Matthew 22, uh, John chapter 5, and then John chapter 11. Uh, so let's get started right here. It's a long message, and I do apologize for the length, but I think you'll understand why as we go through this. Um, let's back up here. Actually, I want to start right here. This is often looked at when Paul brought this message out as being very confusing and uh, troubling and, and a whole lot of other things. And I'm going to hit the basis of this first, and then we're going to break it down. Now, uh, he goes, if then I do that which I would not, I consent unto the law that it is good. Now that it is no more I that do it, but sin that dwelleth in me. For I know that in me that is in my flesh dwelleth no good thing, for... To will is present with me, but how to perform that which is good I find not. For the good that I would do I do not, but the evil which I would not, that I do. Now if I do that I would not, it is no more I that do it, but sin that dwelleth in me. I find then a law that when I would do good, evil is present with me. I delight in the law of God after the inward man, but I see another law in my members, warring against the law of my mind and bringing me into captivity to the law of sin, which is in my members. O wretched man that I am, who shall deliver me from the body of this death? 
Notice that this body of this death. All right. But oddly enough, um, let me just see. We get up here at the top here. You see, Paul is talking about this war in his mind or in his heart, you might say. He is wanting to serve God. But in his body, there is a war going on. And bringing that body into captivity <clears throat> is what's so, so important. What I find, though, fascinating about this is he starts off with a marriage scenario. And you would wonder, what would that have to do with the rest of the chapter? But it actually has a lot to do with it. He says, Know ye not, brethren, for I speak to them that know the law, how that the law hath, hath dominion over a man as long as he liveth. That's the law. For the woman which hath an husband is bound by the law to her husband so long as he liveth. But if the husband be dead, she is loosed from the law of her husband. So then if while her husband liveth, she be married to another man, she shall be called an adulteress. But if her husband be dead, she is free from that law so that she is no adulteress, though she be married to another man. This is a picture of your relationship to Christ. If there is still sin, see, Satan represents sin in the first place. He represents death. And as long as sin is reigning in our mortal body, and then we profess to be married to Christ, then we live in adultery. But once we have taken and we have killed, we have totally annihilated that husband, that former husband of sin, and take it out by the very roots that's embedded within us, then our marriage to Christ is perfectly legal. Wherefore, my brethren, he goes on to say in verse 4, you also become dead to the law by the body of Christ, that you should be married to another, even to him who is raised from the dead, that we should bring forth fruit unto God. For when we were in the flesh, the motions of sin, which were by the law, did work in our members to bring forth fruit unto death. That's all it could do. But now we are delivered from the law, that being dead wherein we were held, that we should serve the new, in the newness of spirit and not in the oldness of the letter. <clears throat> now he, of course, is likening the law to this because as he'll go on later and say, you know, uh, well, it, let's just read it. What shall we say then? Is the law sin? God forbid. Nay, I had not known sin, but by the law, for I had not known lust, except the law had said, thou shalt not covet. But as long as you still have covetousness within your heart, as long as you still desire your neighbor's wife or the cashier girl at the supermarket or, or any of those other things, then sin still is lying within you. You're still married to the old husband. You got to take it out by the roots. You got to totally break it loose yourself from it so that you can truly be married to Christ. Now, I say this about men, but it goes both ways. If you're physically married in this life and you still have that attraction to this guy or that guy or whatever other guy there might be out there, then again, it is covetousness. The law at least lets you know that. And it's got to come out by the roots. But sin taken occasion by the commandment wrought in me all manner of concupiscence. For without the law, sin was dead. If there's no more law, if you're in Christ and there's no more law, then there is no, there, sin truly is dead. But you've got to totally 
uproot that ungodliness from you. For I was alive without the law once, but when the commandment came, sin revived and I died. Wow. But when the commandment came, sin revived and I died. You know, before I go any further, I want to take you to Psalm 23. And maybe you'll think of this psalm totally different from this point forward. A psalm of David. The Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. There should be no desire of want if he truly is your shepherd. He maketh me to lie down in green pastures. He leadeth me beside the still waters. He restoreth my soul. He guideth me in the straight paths for his name's sake. Yea, though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil, for thou art with me. Do you know what the valley of the shadow of death is? That's your walk on this earth. I, maybe like yourself, I was at one time, I actually thought that this meant that, like, in other words, you're right at death's door. I'm not going to fear, for he's with me. Everywhere you walk on this earth, when you walk past people, their body can cast a shadow, but you're walking past many people that are dead. They're dead what? They're dead to... Because they're in sin. They've, there's been no new birth. There's been no resurrection of the soul. It's one thing to die and go into the dust of the earth. But if you'll notice, that's why Jesus says, you know, they, you know they're like, you know, they say, well, you know, you say that if a man, uh, you know, believes in you, that, you know, he'd never die. And, and, and yet our, our forefathers, they, they claim that you knew, you knew Abraham and Abraham is dead. He says, Abraham's not dead. He said he's the God of the living. Abraham attained something they had not attained to. Anyway, yea, though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil. That's here on this earth, for thou art with me. Thy rod and thy staff, they comfort me. That actually stands for the staff is the strength he's given you in your young age, and the rod is the strength he gives you and sustains you in your old age. That's why he speaks of thy staff and the rod. They comfort me. He, David is showing you that he's walking through the valley of the shadow of death. He's walking on this earth and from his old age, from his, to his youth to his old age, he knows that God is with him and he's comforted in that. Thou preparest a table before me in the presence of mine enemies. Thou hast anointed my head with oil. My cup runneth over. Surely goodness and mercy shall follow me all the days of my life and I shall dwell in the house of the Lord forever. He wasn't talking about a physical temple in Jerusalem. He had already come to know that in Christ was that place that he needed to be. So going back to Romans, but sent an occasion by the commandment, wrought in me all manner of concupiscence, for without the law sin was dead. For I was alive without the law once, but when the commandment of sin revived, I died. When sin revives, you're still dead. And the commandment was ordained to life, I found to be unto death. That's because the natural law, death was required. Something had to die. Death, death, death. 
For sin taken occasion by the commandment deceived me, and by it slew me. Wherefore the law is holy, and the commandment holy, and just, and good, was then that which is good made death unto me, God forbid. But sin, that it might appear sin, worketh death in me by that which is good. That sin, by the same commandment, might become exceedingly sinful. For we know that the law is spiritual, but I am carnal, sold under sin. For for that which I do, I allow not. And for what I would, that do I not. But what I hate, that I do. That's when there's still that root of sin that lays within. And that is what's got to come out. If you look at Matthew chapter 3, Jesus says, Think not to say within yourselves, We have Abraham to our father. For I say unto you that God is able of these stones to raise up children unto Abraham. And now also the axe is laid unto the root of the trees. Therefore every tree which bringeth forth not good fruit is hewn down and cast into the fire. I indeed baptize you with water unto repentance, but he that cometh after me, he is mightier than I, whose shoes I am not worthy to bear. He shall baptize you with the Holy Ghost and with fire. You see, if, you know, we are trees ourselves. If we are not bringing forth righteous fruit unto God, then take that axe and uproot the sin that's laying in your life. Expose it. That's the way you uproot it, by the way. That's the way you you unhinge it. You confess it. You expose it. You know, there is a saying written um, in one of the ancient writings there that if the bowels of a man are on the outside, he'll die. But as long as they're hidden within him, he will live. And it also speaks about that in in a type of, of the root of a tree. If the roots are exposed, the tree would die. So the root of sin has to be uprooted out of us so that we truly can live. We truly can be born again. In John chapter 8, we read, Then said Jesus to those Jews which believed on him, If you continue in my word, then are you my disciples indeed. And you shall know the truth, and the truth shall make you free. They answered him, We are Abraham's seed, and we're never born, we're never in bondage to any man. How sayest you, you shall be made free? Jesus answered them, Verily, verily, I say unto you, Whosoever committeth sin is a servant of sin. But see, truth, if you know the truth, if you know Christ, He can make you free from that. He can make you free from that sin that you've become the servant of. The servant abideth not in the house forever, but the son abideth ever. If you get in Christ, if you take that root of bitterness and evil and hatred and guile and malice and lust and everything else that's in there, yeah, it could could be as much as bitterness. You're always bitter about something that somebody does to you and you get really angry at them. You know, Jesus said... If you think in your heart that you want them dead, it's the same as if you went and killed them. I'm just paraphrasing it, but you know what I'm talking about. You want to get it out. You want to uproot that from the very roots in there so that you can truly be born again. The Son, therefore, shall make you free, and you shall be free indeed. I know that you are Abraham's seed, but you seek to kill me because my word hath no place in you. I speak that which I have seen with my father, and you do that which you have seen with your father. You see, our fruit tells us who we really are. And we might have a secret sin nobody else on the planet knows about but you. And of course, God. And all you got to do 
is know him, know him as the truth, confess that, get it out, uproot it, tear the weed completely out of your heart so that you can be made free. They answered and said unto him, Abraham is our father. Jesus saith unto them, if you were Abraham's children, you would do the works of Abraham. But now you seek to kill me, a man that hath told you the truth, which I have heard of God. This did not Abraham. Now he's showing that he was there actually talking to Abraham as one of the three. You do the deeds of your father. Then said they to him, We be not born in fornication. We have one father, even God. Jesus said unto them, If God were your father, you would love me. For I proceeded forth and came from God. Neither came I of myself, but he sent me. Why do you not understand my speech? Even because you cannot hear my word. For you of your father the devil, and the lust of your father you will do. He was a murderer from the beginning, and abode not in the truth, because there is no truth in him. When he speaketh a lie, he speaketh of his own, for he is a liar, and the father of it. And because I tell you the truth, you believe me not. Which of you convinceth me of sin? And if I say the truth, why do you not believe me? He that is of God heareth God's words, yet ye, ye, ye therefore hear them not, because you are not of God. Then answered the Jews, said unto him, Say not well that thou art Samaritan and hast a devil. And Jesus said, I have not a devil, but I honor my father, and you do dishonor me. And I seek not mine own glory. There is one that seeketh and judgeth. Verily I say unto you, if a man keep my sayings, he shall never see death. Then said the Jews unto him, Now we know that thou hast a devil. Abraham is dead. The prophets, and thou sayest, if a man keep my saying, he shall never taste death. Art thou greater than our father Abraham, which is dead, and the prophets are dead? Whom makest thou thyself? I love the way he answers this. Jesus answered, If I honor myself, my honor is nothing. It is my father that honoreth me, of whom you say that he is your God. Yet you know not him, but I know him. If I should say I, not, I know not him not, I shall be a liar like unto you, but I know him and keep his saying. Your father Abraham rejoiced to see my day and saw it and was glad. Then said the Jews unto him, Thou art not yet fifty years old, and hast thou seen Abraham? And Jesus said unto them, Verily, verily, I send to you before Abraham was, I am. Then they took up stones to cast on him, but Jesus hid himself and went out of the temple going through the midst of them and passed by. Now, I think I actually have the place there where he talks about that he is not the, the, the God. Let's see. Let me see if it's over here. Uh, let's see. Let me, let me let me see if I can find it real quick. Uh, and I, I think I got it up there, but I'll just see real quick. Matthew twelve twenty seven. Uh, he didn't say it in that one there, but he does say it here. And and it's touching the dead that they rise. Have you not read in the book of Moses how in the bush God spoke unto him, saying, I am the God of Abraham and the God of Isaac and the God of Jacob. He is not the God of the dead, but the God of the living. You therefore do greatly err. So, as they ask the question here, this is in Mark's gospel. And Jesus answering said unto them, Do you not, do you not therefore err because you know not the scriptures, neither the power of God? For when they shall rise from the dead, they neither marry nor are given in marriage, but are as the angels which are in heaven. And that's when he goes on to say that he's the God of the, not the God of the dead, but the, of the living. And the, and the thing is that they don't even understand. And I, I do know why I've got that. I do have that up there, but I think it's from John's Gospel. 
uh, where I bring that out there. And I'm going to bring that out in a little bit, so we'll just wait. We won't go to that as of yet, though. But um, let's see here. Yeah, we already brought, we, we did this one here. So we got through Psalms there. We already went through Psalm 23 with you. Uh, this is another one I threw in there just for you to see this. And this is in Psalm 103. Who forgiveth all thine iniquities and who healeth all thy diseases? Who redeemeth thy life from the pit? That word actually in Hebrew there is from the grave who encompasseth thee with loving kindness and tender mercies there. That's actually what it's speaking about. So he redeems you from the grave, from death is what he redeems you from. In Matthew chapter 13, um, this is where, let's see. And he spoke many things unto them in parables, saying, Behold, a sower went forth to sow. And when he sowed, some seeds fell by the wayside, and fowls came and devoured them. Some fell upon stony places, which had not much earth, and forthwith they sprung up, because they had no deepness of the earth. When the sun was up, they scorched, because they had no root. Uh, they withered away. By the way, notice that word root right there. No root. Some fell among thorns, and the thorns sprung up and choked them, and others fell on good ground and brought forth fruit, and some a hundredfold, some sixty, and some thirty. Okay? Now, let's move to verse 11. He answered and said unto them, Because it is given unto you, the, the disciples came and said to him, Why speak thou unto them in parables? Talking about the crowds. He said, because it is given unto you to know the mysteries of the kingdom of heaven, but to them it is not given. For whosoever hath to him shall it be given, and he shall have more abundant. But whosoever hath not from him it shall be taken away, even that he hath. Therefore I speak to them in parables, because they seeing see not, hearing they hear not, neither do they understand. Therefore speak I to them in parable, because, because they seeing see not, and hearing they hear not, neither do they understand. And in them is fulfilled the prophecy of Isaiah, which saith, By hearing you shall hear, and shall not understand, and seeing you shall see, and shall not perceive. For this people, people's heart is waxed gross, and their ears are dull of hearing, and their eyes they have closed. Lest at any time they should see with their eyes and hear with their ears and should understand with their heart and should be converted and I should heal them. But blessed are your eyes for they see and your ears for they hear. For verily I say to you that many prophets and righteous men have desired to see those things which you see and have not seen them and to hear those things which you hear and have not heard them. Hear ye therefore the parable of the sower. When any one heareth the word of the kingdom, and understandeth it not, then cometh the wicked one, and catcheth away that which was sown in his heart. This is he which received the seed by the wayside. You see, there's a lot of people that will hear the gospel for just a little bit, but they don't remain. But he that receiveth the seed in stony places, the same as he that heareth the word, and anon with joy receiveth it. Yet hath he no root in himself, but endureth for a while. For when tribulation or persecution ariseth because of the word, by and by he is offended. He also that receives seed among the thorns is he that heareth the word and the care of this world and the deceitfulness of, of riches choke the word and he becometh unfruitful. In the Hebrew Matthew, let me take you to that, verse 22 says, That which fell among the thorns is the one who hears the word and in his desire to gather wealth, Satan causes him to forget the word and God, of God and makes no fruit. 
You know, the scripture does say above all, I would that you prosper and be in good health. But there also comes a time when people can make the prosperity their God. He goes on, but he that received the seed in good ground is he that heareth the word and understands it, which also beareth fruit, bringeth forth some one hundredfold, some sixty, some thirty. Another parable put he forth unto them, saying, The kingdom of heaven is likened unto a man which soweth good seed in his field. But while men slept, his enemy came and sowed tares among the wheat and went his way. But when the blade was sprung up and brought forth fruit, then appeared the tares also. So the servants of the householder came and saith unto him, Sir, didst not thou sow good seed in thy field? From whence then are these tares? He said unto them, An enemy hath done this. The servant said unto him, Wilt thou then we go and gather them up? But he said, No. Lest while you gather up the tares, you root up also the wheat with them. Let both grow together until the harvest. In the time of the harvest, I will say to the reapers, Gather ye together first the tares, and bind them in bundles to burn them. But gather the wheat into my barn. It's about that fruit, and it's also about the root. Is the root in good soil? That good soil is Christ. All right? We're going to keep going. We're going to go deeper and deeper as we go here. John, in chapter 6, the Gospel of John. They said, Is not this Jesus the son of Joseph, whose father and mother we know? Is is it then that he saith, I came down from heaven? Jesus therefore answered and said unto them, Murmur not among yourselves. No man can come to me except the Father which hath sent me draw him. And I will raise him up at the last day. Now that's an interesting point. When is the resurrection? See, no man can come to me except the Father which hath sent me draw him. And I will raise him up at the last day. It is written in the prophets, and they shall be all taught of God. Every man therefore that hath heard and hath learned of the Father cometh unto me. Do you realize, verse 45, and I don't want to get away from this last day. We're going to come back to it. Verse 45, it is written in the prophets, and they shall be all taught of God, is Isaiah chapter 2 being fulfilled. And many people shall go and say, Come ye, and let us go up into the mountain of the Lord, to the house of God of Jacob, and he will what? Teach us his ways, and we will walk in his paths. For out of Zion shall go forth the law, and the word of the Lord from Jerusalem. There you have it right there. That was when that was fulfilled. And John says here, as he quotes Jesus, No man can come to me except the Father which has sent me draw him, and I will raise him up at the last day. Do you know when he breathed on his apostles and he said, Receive ye the gift of the Holy Ghost or the Holy Spirit, that was when the last day was. I will raise him up at the last day. Just before he left this world. Raising them up was when he had filled them with the Spirit. They were truly being born again. That is actually your resurrection. Because why? You are walking in death on this earth until he quickens you unto life. That's why he says back over there, have you not read that he is the God of the living? When he quotes Moses and he says to Moses, you know, let's just, let's take a look at what he says to Moses. It's in the book of Exodus. I believe it's chapter three, if I'm not mistaken. Right? Um, yeah, right here. And when the Lord saw that he turned aside to see, God called unto him out of the midst of the bush and said, Moses, Moses, he said, here am I. 
Draw now hither, put off your shoes from off your feet. The place where you stand is holy ground. I can't help but believe that's the very place he created Adam. That's why he called it holy ground. Moreover, he said, I am the God of thy father. The Yomer Anochi Elohi Avicha. The God of Isaac, the God of Jacob, and Moses hid his face. See? Elohai Abraham, Elohai Yitzhak, Elohai Yaakov. I am the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, and the God of Jacob. And like Jesus said, he was not speaking, they were not dead. He is the God of the living. They had already become one. He didn't refer to them, I am the God of your fathers that are dead laying in a grave somewhere. I find that so fascinating. So, so fascinating. So, let's go back here. I will raise him up at the last day. Now, your body will go to sleep in the dust of the earth. But oddly enough, and I believe it was in Thomas, if you do, or maybe it's Philip that wrote that, where the actual, the very woman that called this Gnostic writing said five of those books should be called early Christian Gospels. The very scholar that called it Gnostic said it should be called early Christian Gospels. She said the only difference in those five books was it was the deeper teaching. She, and she quoted from Mark. Where, in fact, I just quoted to you from, I think it was either Mark or Matthew 1, the exact same passage there. I speak to them in parables, but to you I speak openly. And she said that's what those books were. They were the secret teaching Jesus taught those disciples. It was not the public teaching. And in the one writing he said, uh, I forget how it was worded there, something to the effect of, you know, you have to receive the resurrection first. Here. He even talked about how Christ was resurrected before he ever went into the grave. He was one with the Father, in other words. That's why Jesus said, In that day you will know that I am in the Father, the Father is in me, and I am in you, and you are in me. In fact, there's another scripture that even blows your mind even further away than that. And that's a very passage. Let me see if I can find it here for you real quick. Um, you know what? Let me look it up down here. I'll, I want to show you in the Hebrew, Matthew, because it's very fascinating, you know. Um, Matthew, yeah, Matthew 8.20. Let me see if I have that. That's in chapter 13. Did I have, no, I didn't have it in another. Let me, let me pull this up for you. And I, I just, I just recently understood what, I had an idea what this meant, but I just recently got the complete understanding and had it confirm cross-referencing this. Right here it is. Jesus answered him, the foxes have holes and the birds have nests, but the Son of Man, now we read in the King James, James, has no place to lay his head. In the Hebrew Matthew, he actually says, but the Son of Man, the Son of the Virgin, and by the way, that's there fits the argument, you know, because like Tovia and all these others, they want to say that, you know, uh, it, it says Alma when it speaks of in Isaiah, a virgin shall conceive. An Alma, which means a young woman. All right. And he says he doesn't say Bitula, which is a virgin, but he says Alma. And I, I'm like, OK, well, I mean, it's pretty obvious that she's a virgin. It's her first child. But Jesus in the Hebrew Matthew actually stressed it. In uh, verse 22, uh, when he says, um, let me make sure it's verse 22. Uh, verse 20, I'm sorry. 
So I'll take you over here to verse the Hebrew here. Ve'an Eliav Yeshua le'shalim charaim. Okay, I want to get to the actual. Okay, ve'levan uh, Adam. See, he's the son of of Adam. Okay, in other words, he comes to a body of flesh. Ben Habitula, the son, literally, Bitula, the son of the virgin. So he's not just son of man, but he's also the son of the virgin, as he said. So he was born a virgin birth, clearly, as he identifies here. Has no place, and then he says, to enter his head. And I'm like, wow, enter his head? What does that mean? Ain makum, which means there is no place. There isn't a place. La kines, which means for to enter. Roshav, his head. We already know, as I taught you from the Greek language there uh, not long ago, that the word head is source and the head of Christ is God. So the foxes had dens, the birds have the nests, but the Son of Man had no place to enter his head. Think about that for a while, right? Blows me away. Well, the entering the head is the place of rest. And when you enter into Christ, See, Christ entered into the Father so that we could enter into Him so that we could enter our rest. That is the resurrection. And being born again, rooting up that sin, that evil that is in our life, and getting that completely out allows us to become one with the Father. Because why? As the Scripture said already, you cannot be married to that old husband and be married to another. unless If you are, if you're still married to the law or you're still married to sin, if sin's not been rooted up out of you, you're an adulteress. That's what doesn't enter the kingdom of heaven. So you can't even get into Christ. That's why Jesus talks about they come on the wedding day, they come and they found a man came in. He didn't have the he had the didn't have the wedding garment on, and he says, How did you get in here? He climbed up some other way. There is no other way except through that new birth. Truly being born again, becoming one with Christ. Right? Okay. So we know now that raising up the last day. He breathed upon them, right? Isaiah also, I showed you how that was the fulfillment right there of the scripture where he came, uh, let's see. Um, yeah, and, and they shall all be taught of God. So we saw that. Now let's look at Hosea, another one showing the fulfillment of these things. Hosea writes here, Come and let us return unto the Lord, for he hath torn, he will heal us. He hath smitten, he will bind us up making us one with Christ. Jesus Didn't Jesus say, in that day you will know I am in the Father, the Father is in me, and I am in you, and you are in me. This is Hosea's message. After two days, he will revive us. And believe me, they like to say, and I used to teach the same thing that the two days with the 2,000 years and on the third day, uh, he'll raise us up. Talking about Israel and 3,000 years later when Hosea gave the prophecy 700 and what is it, 60 or 780 B.C. And by the time 2,000 years came around and everything, we're now in the third day and they want to say this is the day that Israel becomes a nation again. No, 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 no. See, false teaching of prophecy is what causes people to believe a lie and you will never ever reach the new birth as long as you're holding a lie. Of, that is another root of deception. That's the root of deception that has to be rooted out. After two days, he will revive us. He's in the earth for two days. On the third day, he will raise us up. Even those that were in the dust of the earth, he brought with him. That we may what? Live in his presence. 
And let us know eagerly strive to know the Lord. His going forth is sure as the morning, and he shall come unto us as the rain, and as the latter rain that watereth the earth. His teaching, the teaching of Jesus Christ, is both former and latter rain. By the way, the word in there literally is more geshem, teaching rain. O Ephraim, shall, what shall I do unto you? And O Judah, what shall I do unto you? For your goodness is as a morning cloud and as a dew that early passes away. That's why on Acts chapter 2 when he says, Be it known unto you, O house of Israel, Ephraim, this same Jesus whom you have crucified, in other words, your goodness, you received it for a little bit and then you killed him. Matthew chapter 22. For in the resurrection they neither marry nor are given in marriage. Let me back up a little bit so we catch the full saying. Of the, saying, Master Moses said, If a man die having no children, his brother shall marry his wife and raise up seed unto his brother. Now there were with us seven brethren, and the first, when he had married a wife, deceased, and having no issue, left his wife unto his brother. Likewise, the second also, the third unto the seventh. And alas, all the woman died also. Therefore, in the resurrection, whose wife shall she be of the seven? For they all had her. I love it. And I get it now. I didn't get it before, but I get it now. Jesus answered and said to them, "Do You do err, not knowing the scriptures nor the power of God. For in the resurrection they neither marry nor are given in marriage, but are the, as the angels of God in heaven. You're one with God. Do you not know in Genesis chapter 2? Remember what we read here? After all this sin and everything, and the woman had been taken out of the man. I even quoted to you where Philip said, death set in when the woman was taken out of the man. But if the woman ever enters into her husband again, death will cease to be. Right? And here we have it. And the man said, this is now bone of my bones and flesh of my flesh. She shall be called woman because she was taken out of man. No longer being referred to Adam, but she was taken what? From Meish. From that fire of God. And she's called what? Isha. She's the feminine form of the fire of God. You took the masculine and the feminine and you separated it. But then he goes on to say, Therefore shall a man, I love it, not an Adam, but an Ish. Therefore shall a, shall a fire of God leave his father and his mother. Ve aviv, ve et imo. That's why Jesus said over there, and he said it correctly, Ben Adam, the son of man, the Ben Betulah, and the son of the virgin. He was showing you there's no sin where he come from. He come from the man to become the kinsman redeemer. He became that flesh form for as a kinsman redeemer. But he came from a bitulah. He came from a virgin to show that he was from what? Isha. Therefore shall a man leave his father and his mother and shall cleave unto his wife and they shall be what? One flesh. He came here to restore back. He came here so that we could be born again, so that we could truly be one with him, so that we could be resurrected in Christ Jesus, sitting with him right now in heavenly places. Take the root of sin out of there, then you'll get there. This is so, so amazing. But it's touching the resurrection of the dead. Have you not read that which was spoken unto you by God saying, I am the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, and the God of Jacob. God is not the God of the dead, but he's the God of the living. Oh my God. This is what he was talking about. And everybody's all worried and nervous. They're like, am I going to get to heaven? Am I going to have my wife again and everything? She'll be your sister. You'll be her brother. 
but she'll be complete because she's one with God, like the angels of heaven. She's one with him. There's no need, and well, she had seven husbands. Well, if those seven husbands got one with Christ, then everything will be all right, then won't it? Won't be no problem. Let's continue on. We're getting close to the end now. Verily I say unto you, the hour is coming. Watch what he says. And now is when the dead shall hear the voice of the Son of God. And they that hear shall live. Notice what he said, though. I say unto you, the hour is coming. Okay, right there. See there? See what he says? The hour. I'm trying to. So, oh, goodness, messed up, back up. The hour is coming. But then he says, and now is when the dead shall hear the voice of the Son of God. So both in the future and in the very moment that he was speaking, the dead were hearing his voice. He wasn't talking about the dead in the graves. He was talking about the people he was walking among. Like David said, though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, right? Death was all around him. He's walking around a bunch of dead people. For as the Father hath life in himself, so hath he given to the Son to have life in himself. And hath given him authority to execute judgment also because he is the Son of Man. Marvel not this, for the hour is coming in which all that are in the grave shall hear his voice. See, he doesn't talk about the ones that are now. He's talking about the, the coming time is the ones that were in the graves. And he shall come forth, and they shall have done good unto the resurrection of life, and they that have done evil unto the resurrection of damnation. Whoa, 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 whoa. In other words, the ones that were in the grave that had not heard his voice yet. They're going to get resurrected to life. I can, I can of my own self do nothing. As I hear, I judge. My judgment is just because I seek not mine own will, but the will of the Father which has sent me. If I bear witness to myself, my witness is not true. But go back, though. And now is. He didn't actually go into that. He just talked about the resurrection of those that were asleep, right? But the one, But see, there's a resurrection of damnation, too. It's whatever your root is. That's why we have the time now. Because if we're children of God, we hear the voice of God, then we're able. See, that's why you don't have to worry about it. You might be concerned. Well, Brother Steve, uh, how am I going to get this root of evil out of me? I do have this problem. I do get angry and I get mad. I want to beat the dickens and the fire out of my boss. Get that root out of there. If you're his, he's giving you the ability to do it. We truly want to become one with him. See, the reason why Paul wrote, that that I don't want to do, I do it, that's because the root of that law, that bitterness is still there, that evil, that lust, or whatever it might be, it's there. Root it up. Get it out of your life. He can, he'll help you do it. The first thing is just the revelation of knowing that, he's, that you're free from all this. And you can uproot that evil and it won't bother you no more. In John's Gospel 11, Jesus saith unto her, Thy brother shall rise again. Martha said unto him, I know that he shall rise again in the resurrection at the last day. <laughs> By the way, that last day still is when Jesus came, right? Jesus said to her, I am the resurrection and the life. He that believeth in me, though he were dead, yet shall he live. He's not even talking about Lazarus. And whosoever liveth and believeth in me shall never die. Believest thou this? I thought they all went by the way of the grave. Think about it.
your body can do what he's that's why jesus said fear not them that have power over the body but him that has power over both soul and body okay oh, don't need that so anyway i i trust this really is a blessing to you and i do want to pray with you to encourage you to know any of you oh, wait a minute i do have let me see exodus Okay, no, we already we already did those. Okay, I just want to make sure I wasn't leaving something out. All right. Anyway, I want to pray with you even now. If some of you may be feeling right now, gosh, wow, ooh, I still got those issues there that are that are really that are, you know, brother Steve, I've had some things that have been bothering me for a long time. But I really want to be born again. I want to be filled with the Holy Spirit, washed in His blood. Pray for me. Heavenly Father, I realize that there are little things that hinder so many of us, Father. And just like the people that I'm speaking to now, Father, I want everything rooted up. I don't want not one thing left in there nowhere. I want to truly be one with you as they want to be one with you. So I'm asking you, Father, please help these people. I ask it and pray for them. In the name of Jesus Christ, Yeshua HaMashiach, Ani Shoelocha Adonai. Amen. You just trust God, believing. Uh, just in closing, I, I wanted to share a testimony I heard the other day. I was doing this broadcast with John Moore on, on the Liberty Liberty Man there, uh, where we, we he, do, he dedicates an hour to about life wave and I've always told you guys I don't I don't support products, but this has been so amazing for so many people. So I, I'll, I look at it like this: not everybody's faith reaches to divine healing, and not to say that we can't. We can, but sometimes God uses your faith in a different way. Like I've shared the testimony about Granny that had brain tumor that I prayed for. She wouldn't believe for divine healing, but she believed if I prayed that God would touch the doctor's hand, she'd be made well, and she was. This may be your avenue as well. So let me just share this one little testimony here. Another man, and he got started because of hearing Kathleen's testimony of the cataract that fell out of her eye. Uh, I want to share this with you, though. Uh, and I may have this testimony a little messed up there. It's just a little audio there and for you to think about. Listen to this. Maybe you and my engineer can figure it out. Our next caller is Scott in Illinois. Good morning, Scott. Very fine. Go ahead, Scott. Okay. I'm, uh, I'm with um, X-39 Lightweight six months now. Six months. And um, I went to see my doctor about a month ago, and he told me, uh, you're no longer pre-diabetic. I said, well, that's good. He said, and your blood pressure is per the lady said, your blood pressure is perfect. And I was blown away because it hasn't been perfect for 10 years. <laughs> and um, they're both uh, interested in LifeWave now. I'm not sure if they're connected with it yet and then i went to my eye doctor and um i told him that i heard the, about a lady who had her cataracts fall out of her eyes out of one of her eyes i heard steve talking about it and he just started laughing and then he started looking for my cataracts and he couldn't find them and then i started laughing and um so I don't have cataracts anymore. No surgery. I don't need anything. I'm, I'm sure it was X-39 that did that for me. Thank God. And uh, I just wanted to share that with you. He was pre-diabetic. I know it's a little scratchy there, but he was pre-diabetic. And his doctor said, well, I wanted to tell you, you're no longer pre-diabetic. And he had been suffering with high blood pressure for 10 years. 
and the nurse said she couldn't believe it, but his blood pressure was normal. First time in 10 years they had taken his blood pressure, it was normal. Uh, then he goes to his eye doctor, tells, him, tells her about Kathleen's testimony, the cataract falling out of one of her eyes, and the eye doctor laughs at him. Uh, he said then he goes to look for his look at, to check his eyes because he had cataracts in both eyes and both his cataracts were gone, and he said then he started laughing at the doctor. So uh, I just wanted to share that with you there and uh, just rem a reminder for you in the description below lifewave.com forward slash benoon. You can email me especially if I could help you with this. Just email me benoonx39 at gmail.com. Myself or my wife will check the email. Glad to help you in any way we can. Uh, also, uh, we're very actively writing uh, now again, not just doing the videos, but actually writing on israelinewslive.com. I'm sure many of you have already seen this one here, Betrayed by Medical Freedom Community. Uh, that was very sad. It's not all those that are that did that, by no means, but there were a handful that did. Uh, and then the latest letter is Open Letter to the Five Docs that my wife wrote there. I think you'll find that very enlightening. Um, and so we appreciate you. We appreciate your support of the work. And by the way, too, if you're on our website, that's easy to get to our life wave too. You could just click right there if you wanted to join. You can click there and go straight to it. So EMP Shield as well. Uh, we have all the information now to make it easier on our website, the INL code of 50. And if you want to get one for your home or whatever it may be. Thank you. God bless you. I really hope, I know how I feel about this message in my heart that I shared with you today. And so I'm hoping that it's really a blessing for you. Um, let me see. There was a couple of things that I'd made notes of myself. I just want to see if there's anything that I'm missing. Uh, let's see here, because I just want to make sure. Um, oh, goodness here. Yeah, I, I think pretty much I, I've shared with you everything that I was going to. Hmm. Um, this was one. I'll just I want to read this to you here. I don't even remember where I found this at, uh, but I I made a copy of it uh, for that place to which they extend their thoughts is is their root uh, and which lifts up them upward through all the heights to the father they reach his head which is the rest for them and i really thought about that in light of what the hebrew matthew said when jesus said he had no way to enter his head talking about the father to enter into he because we know that he mentioned you know the birds have or the foxes have uh, uh, holes and the birds have nests, but the Son of Man hath no place. King James says, lay his head. In other words, for rest. Uh, and the uh, Hebrew Matthew says, enter his head, which also is a type of rest. But what's really important, too, is that our very thoughts, if you remember, there was a scripture I shared with you guys not long ago about that. Um, let's see, what is it, you know? Um uh, where your heart is, there your treasure is. Uh, that's, in other words, that's where the very depth of your soul is. What your true deep desires are reflect in reality before you. So if it's sin, you're going to find that if that's where your heart is, then that's the treasures around you. But if it's truly for Christ, which is what we want, truly for Christ, then it will be all around you. That's what we want. And we want to truly be there in him, in our rest. That's our rest in Christ Jesus. I'm Stephen Benoon. You're watching Israeli News Live. God bless you and have a great day.